Hello everyone, I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and this is Last Week in the Church. It is the show rigorously, faithfully, unalterably devoted to telling you things about the Vatican and the Catholic Church that you already know. I am rocking my Italia gear today, so you will see my azzurri, my blue Italia t-shirt, and what the Italians call the tricolore. That's the Italian flag. It's called tricolore because it has three colors, as you can see. Because today, Italy are the champions of Europe, having defeated, vanquished England in a thrilling, hard-fought, anguished uh, game last night that ended in a penalty kick shootout, which Italy won. Uh, and believe me when I tell you that Italy is a nation that needed this win, and it needed it badly. Uh, today, there is a spirit of joy up and down the peninsula that you just really, well, you have to be here to experience it. It is a really special thing. Here's what we've got for you on the show this week. Uh, Dr. Doctor, the Pope is in the hospital. Uh, you can't handle the truth. The stage is set for a dramatic Vatican trial. Uh, and finally, the Catholic subtext of Italy's big win last night. That's our show. Please stick around for the details. <laughs> All right, we begin with Pope Francis uh, is currently in the Gemelli Hospital, though probably not for much longer. Uh, word is that the Pope is going to be released from the hospital either sometime later today, that is Monday or tomorrow, Tuesday. Uh, he has been there since last Sunday. So just to recap what has happened, <clears throat> last Sunday, which by the way was July 4th, uh, I know that, uh, because at roughly, well, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, last Sunday, uh, we had about 20 journalist friends on the terrace of our Rome apartment celebrating July 4th. I was grilling <clears throat> hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken. We had baked beans. We had pulled pork. We had potato salad. We had everything you would want for a beer. Everything you would want for a July 4th barbecue. Uh, at roughly 3 o'clock, uh, news broke that Pope Francis was headed to the Gemelli Hospital. All of our journal friends moved inside to our living room, which became a de facto press center. Uh, they were all tweeting the news, uh, sending alerts to their home offices. By 3.30, all of those journals were gone. Then what happened is we had another wave of non journo friends uh, who showed up, who took us through the rest of the day. I, of course, am a journo, but I had told all of my employers that I was off that day. Uh, but in any event, this, new, this news fell like a thunderclap uh, out of a clear blue sky. Although the Vatican insists this was a planned surgery, that is, they insist it was not an emergency, that Pope Francis uh, had been advised that he required surgical treatment for diverticulitis of the colon. <clears throat> and I will freely admit to you that as of a week ago, I had no idea what diverticulitis meant. Uh, but essentially what it means uh, is that small sacs form in the colon, which block uh, the movement of material through the colon, uh, which, you know, essentially makes digestion and all that very difficult. And so uh, all that had to be removed. The colon had to be repaired. Uh, and so uh, he was taken to the Gemelli Hospital that afternoon. Uh, he delivered his regular Sunday Angelus address that day, by the way, that noontime Angelus address looked fine, seemed fine, uh, but that afternoon he was taken to the Gemelli. Uh, the surgery was performed. The Vatican subsequently informed us uh, that the surgery went well, that Pope Francis was recovering as anticipated, uh, that he was going to have to be in the hospital several days just so the medical team could monitor 
his recovery and make sure everything is going as anticipated. Uh, he has remained in the Jameli all the past week. At one point, uh, he went around to visit patients who were in the hospital and also to thank people taking care of him. There was video of him in a wheelchair moving around the hospital, chatting with patients, chatting with the medical team. Uh, and the expectation, as I said, uh, is that he will now be released, if not today, certainly tomorrow. Uh, now, what are we to make of all of this? Well, uh, I think there are probably three points to be made. Uh, one, uh, this was never a life-threatening condition. Uh, the Pope has apparently come through the surgery just fine. Uh, when, if, you, if you saw him uh, when he was in the hospital greeting people, he looked alert. He looked uh, healthy. I mean, he, he, he looked himself. There did not seem to be any particular diminishment. So uh, I think it is probably safe to say that while no surgery is ever minor, uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a case uh, in which uh, the, you know, the, the Pope has come through this and come out of it and seems fine. Okay, that's point one. Uh, point two, uh, nevertheless, this was what we call in the trade a papal health scare. Uh, and there are certain rules for a papal health scare. One of those rules uh, is that the media will overreact. Uh, and we did. Uh, you know, on Sunday, we treated this like it was the invasion of Normandy, you know, like, uh, like we'd collided with another planet. Uh, like this was the biggest thing that had ever happened. In truth, it really isn't. The dynamic of a papal health scare is, is that we will overinterpret both bad news and good news. That is, if we hear the Pope is in the hospital, we will proclaim that he is on death's door. Uh, if we hear that the surgery went well, we will proclaim him resilient and valiant and indestructible. Neither of these things are true quite honestly. Uh, you know, someday Pope Francis, like every pope who has come before him, will run in to a health situation that he cannot surmount. Or uh, he will simply decide that, you know, the, the cumulative wear and tear of the office and age uh, is enough for him to decide to resign. So the end will come someday. Uh, and here's what I am willing to guarantee you. Uh, we in the media will announce the end prematurely, and then we will be slow to recognize it when it actually happens. Uh, and finally, third, uh, the question of Vatican communications throughout this crisis. Now, so the Vatican told us on Sunday uh, in the bulletin announcing that the Pope is going to the hospital that this was planned. It was known in advance. The obvious question is, well, if that's true, why didn't you tell us? Because they didn't. Uh, and they've never answered that question, by the way, all week. So we don't really know why the decision was made to keep this under wraps. Would be nice to know. Uh, along the way, the only information that we have received about the Pope's condition is a once daily declaration from the spokesperson of the Vatican press office, which is typically reassuring, saying everything is going great. Now, the thing is, I know the director of the Vatican press office. He's a friend of mine. He's an Italian layman by the name of Matteo Bruni. Uh, he's part of the community of San Egidio. He is a great guy. Uh, he is kind. Uh, he is generous. He is humble. He's a wonderful man, but you know what he's not? He's not a medical doctor, okay? He does not have a medical degree. Uh, and so why we are taking his reassurances seriously uh, is a little bit beyond me. During previous papal health crises, uh, we would get briefings from the medical team at the Gemelli Hospital. The doctor treating the Pope would come out. He would stand in front of TV cameras. Uh, and he would say, okay, here's what we did today, here's what's happening, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, and, you know, you could take that seriously because this was the person who was actually responsible for the Pope's medical treatment. Now, it would seem that in this case, the Vatican has told the Gemelli not to do that. Because, I mean, honestly, why wouldn't the Gemelli do it? <laughs> I mean, it's great publicity for the Gemelli Hospital, right? The doctor standing there in front of the backdrop that has Gemelli all over it and telling the whole world he's the guy who was trusted with the Pope's medical care. It is great PR for the hospital, right? So it would seem that the Vatican uh, has imposed a kind of gag order here. And the obvious question is, why? Like, what is it that there is to hide here? I mean, everything we have to work with, certainly seeing this video of the Pope uh, moving around the hospital would suggest he's doing fine. There doesn't seem to be any deep, dark secret to conceal. So why this fear of coming clean? And it is especially ironic because one of the watchwords, one of the hallmarks, of the reform that Pope Francis has launched in the Vatican is supposed to be transparency. And yet, in this instance, there seems to be an aversion to transparency. So, I, you know, I, I don't know if this is going to be, I mean, I am sure that once the Pope is back in the Vatican and resuming his normal duties, that there will be a kind of post-action report in the Vatican I would certainly hope that this is one of the things that is discussed. Because to be quite honest with you, it is very difficult to preach transparency to the rest of the church, to say this is what we are supposed to be. And yet when the chips are down, to be seen not practicing it. All right, we shift now to the second big story uh, of the last week, and that is you can't handle the truth. The big Vatican trial last Saturday, the day before the Pope went to the Gemelli Hospital, the Vatican's prosecutor's office handed down indictments of 10 individuals, that is 10 people, uh, and three corporate entities for various forms of financial crime most of them related uh, to the Vatican's infamous, notorious London real estate scandal. Uh, this is a scandal in which the Vatican's Secretariat of State, that's the 800-pound gorilla uh, in the Vatican scene, that is the department that lives to tell other departments what to do, uh, this department was caught uh, trying to spend about, well, in the end, it was more than $400 million, trying to purchase uh, a former Harrods warehouse in the London neighborhood of Chelsea, which was originally slated to be turned into luxury apartments and thus to return a, a, a nice, you know, a, a nice uh, income on investment. Uh, now, this went bad uh, in 2018. Lots of heads have rolled since. Uh, now, 10 people are indicted. The headline is that for the very first time, and I want to emphasize that because we're talking about an institution that is the Vatican, that it, in its present form has about 600 years of history, but in some form has more than 2,000 years of history. For the very first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church has been indicted under the Vatican's criminal law and is going to be put on trial. This is Italian Cardinal uh, Angelo Becciu, uh, who was, well, uh, his last job was he was the prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. But before that, he was the sostituto or the substitute basically the chief of staff for the Pope uh, in the Secretary of State. And the charge uh, is that Beichu used that position to dispense financial favors to family and friends. Uh, not merely uh, his role in the London scandal, uh, but also other episodes. Uh, now, also uh, among the 10 people indicted, 
uh, was the former head of the Vatican, well, of what the Italians call IFE, the Vatican's Financial Information Authority, which is its anti-money laundering and anti-financing of terrorism watchdog unit. Uh, it's a unit that was created under Pope Benedict. Uh, and the guy brought in to head it was a Swiss lawyer by the name of Rene Brulhart. Now, Brulhart was already famous. He had been the head of the financial information unit in Liechtenstein. And while there, he basically turned that little country's reputation around. It was known as a tax haven, a financial pariah. Uh, through a, ver a variety of reform measures, Brulhart got it on the white lists uh, of virtuous financial players. He was one of the founders of the Egmont Group, which is the international consortium of financial intelligence units. I mean, Rene Brulhart was Mr. Clean, okay? Uh, one of his claim to fame, by the way, is that when he was with the Egmont Group, uh, he actually restored Saddam Hussein's private jet to the people of Iraq after the 2003 war. Uh, because after the war, of course, people were chasing all of who, you know, Hussein's riches. Brulhart followed the paper trail. He found this jet uh, and gave it back to the people of Iraq. That's who he was. <coughs> he is on the list of the people that the Vatican indicted. Uh, mysteriously, by the way, because uh, the Financial Intelligence Unit was created to do one thing and one thing only, and that is oversee the Vatican Bank. It has no authority over the Secretary of State. Never has, never will. And yet, in the indictment, Brulhart is accused of a lapse of supervisory judgment. What? Supervision for what? He was never the supervisor of the Secretary of State. There's only one supervisor of the Secretary of State, and that's the Pope. Nevertheless, I guess, uh, these issues will be resolved at trial. Now, one curious thing about these indictments is that al although 10 people were indicted, there were two who weren't. One is Italian Cardinal Pietro Parolin who is the Vatican Secretary of State. And the other is Venezuelan Archbishop Edgar Peña Para, who is the current Sustituto. Now, both of these guys are Francis' favorites. They are close allies and collaborators of Pope Francis. And in the 488-page Bill of Indictment, the Vatican prosecutor concludes that Parolin and Peña Para, even though they approved all of these transactions related to the London deal, in writing, at every stage, I mean, there are memos with their signatures in which they say, we approve of this. Despite all that, uh, the conclusion was that they're not criminally responsible because they were deceived by the people who were indicted. Now, uh, you know, we will see when the trial begins. Perhaps that is absolutely the case. On the other hand, uh, the, the cynical reading uh, of all of this would be that Bechu is someone that Francis had already decided he had no further use for. I mean, after all, Francis took him out of the substitute's job and put him into saints, and then he kicked him out of saints and essentially stripped him of his privileges as a cardinal. And all these other people who have been indicted uh, are people who, for one reason or another, had already run afoul uh, of the powers that be. So basically speaking, the cynical reading would be the Vatican has indicted all the people the Pope no longer likes, but it is preserved from any kind of exposure the people the Pope does like. Um, perhaps the evidence will support that, perhaps the evidence won't. The first hearing in the trial is slated for July 27th. The expectation is uh, that probably it will be adjourned until September uh, because for Italians, the August vacation is absolutely sacrosanct. 
Uh, we will see about that as well. Uh, all right, finally, uh, the Catholic subtext of Italy's big win last night. So, Italy, as you may remember, was the first country to be struck by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, outside of China, obviously. Uh, it was the European country by far that has been hit the hardest. Uh, the death toll here is staggering. The economic dislocations caused by the coronavirus have been staggering. Italy is a country that has suffered. So when the European soccer championships begin this year, and I should note that there are very few things that unify all Italians, north to south. An Italian living in the Piedmont region, bordering France or Switzerland, does not really think they have much in common with an Italian living in Sicily, which is much closer to North Africa than it is to the Piedmont. And you know, the, there are so many, I mean, Italy was not a unified nation until 1870. There are so many things that divide this country, mountains, seas, history. There are really only about, I would say, three things that unite Italians, all Italians. One, food. Now, there are great regional differences in food, but the passion for food uh, is a defining Italian characteristic. Second, the Catholic Church. Italians share the faith. And finally, Il Nazionale, the national soccer team. It is no accident that uh, Italy, as I said, was, was only technically unified in 1870, but it really didn't start coming together as a nation until the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, and it was in the 1930s that Italy won two World Cups in a row, 1934 and 1938. And in that period, the Italian passion, I would say even mania for soccer and for the national team was born. When the national team is playing, it is one time that you know every Italian in this country from the far north, from the far south, you know what they're doing for three hours. They're watching the team play. And so this run in the European tournament, it combined a defining Italian passion with a nation badly, badly in need of an infusion of happiness, of joy, of relief. Now, you might ask, what does all this have to do with the Catholic Church. Is there any religious subtext to this at all? Well, look, at one level, the answer is no. I mean, or if there is, it's all accidental. Like, it is true that one of Italy's best players is named Federico Chiesa, which is the Italian word for church. I mean, uh, it's true that the, the final was played on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Uh, it is true that a lot of Italians, when they were going on social media to show loyalty for their team, fell back on religious imagery. So, like, there was this one meme of, Ital of Italy's starting lineup as the Twelve Apostles going around, uh, and so on. Uh, but that's all kind of window dressing. But here, I think, are two ways uh, in which this was actually a Catholic moment. One. So, when Italy played Spain in the semifinals, we had a bunch of people over to our apartment here in Rome. We're lucky to have a big terrace. We can watch the game outside and serve some food, and it was great. And a number of Italians were among us. Let me tell you what happened. It was a hard-fought game. Spain actually had the better of Italy for most of the game. But they ended up tied in regulation. They went to extra time, and then they went to a penalty kick shootout. Let me tell you what happened. All of our Italian friends suddenly began whipping holy cards out of their wallets to put on the TV. Rosaries started being dangled from the TV. There was an image of Maria Salas Popoli Romani that suddenly cropped up. 
Um, my point uh, is, and by the way, one of our Italian friends is a guy who proclaims himself anti-clerical, says he hates the Catholic Church, thinks it's all about money and power. It's a huge fraud. In that moment, that guy was on his knees begging the Madonna to be with Italy. My point uh, is that you scratch beneath the surface uh, of any Italian, and there beats the heart of an ardent, devoted Catholic uh, who, who just knows that when the chips are down, that's what they have to fall back on. And that scene, I promise you, was repeated all up and down the, uh, the Italian peninsula. I Italians who haven't darkened the door of a church in decades discovered themselves Catholic. Uh, here's the other sense in which this was kind of a Catholic moment. The Italian Catholic Church was kind of smart uh, about all of this because all up and down the peninsula, parishes and Catholic organizations and Catholic institutions organized watch parties uh, and invited people to come. They provided them food. They provided them drink. They provided them a big screen TV to watch the game. And they invited them all to come for mass before. So they said, come at 7, we'll have mass. At 9, we'll have the game. There'll be food. There'll be drink. It'll be great. It was kind of an evangelical moment. And you got to understand that in Italy, with, parish, with, with closures and suspensions of public liturgies for almost a year, uh, and even now, the obligation to attend Sunday Mass has not been reimposed by the Italian bishops uh, because they want to respect people who can't come for various reasons uh, related to COVID. Uh, you know, mass attendance here dropped dramatically. There are a lot of people who have not been to church in a long time who showed up for the first time Sunday night because they wanted to watch the game with a bunch of other people because Italians are by nature social people. In times of stress, in times of joy, in times of suffering, they want to be part of a communion of saints. And I ask you, in the end, what is more Catholic than that? So, what I have to say this week, ladies and gentlemen, Forza Azzurri! The trophy didn't go home, Brits. It came to Rome! That is our show for this week. Thank you for watching. We will be here next Monday. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy. If you like this show, please go online to the social media platform of your choice. Give us a retweet. Give us a like. Uh, also, please check out the Crux site, cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. Uh, you'll notice we're in the middle of our online fundraising drive. If you can help us out from the bottom of our collective hearts, we would be grateful. Our independence is our most precious asset, but it's not free. We need your help in paying for it. All right, we'll see you next Monday. And between now and then, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will see you again soon.